Anyway, we will just give people a few minutes to sign on and then we'll get started in just a couple minutes. Some people joining, welcome. Welcome, everyone. everyone just a moment or so to, to, to sign on. Um, this webinar will be recorded. So if you'd like to view it again later or share it with some other people at another time, that's going to be a possibility. You'll be able to find it on our website. Okay, go ahead and get started, Emily. So All my right. name Welcome, Emily. From, and this is our, our first collaborative webinar, and I'm very excited to go over the uh, our understanding of social developments in children together for you today. Um, my name is Jen Reed. I am one of the education directors at the Lucy Daniels School, which is a part of the Lucy Daniels Center. I taught in the preschool, in the kindergarten, and the elementary school classrooms uh, at the Lucy Daniels School. So I bring a lot of uh, history and understanding of the emotional and social development, development of children in the school, set, school setting. And Emily here, who she'll introduce herself in just a moment, brings um, a clinical background to understanding what takes place in the social development of children. And together, we're going to help you think a little bit about how everyday activities provide opportunities for children to grow socially, even if they are not with peers. Uh, there are a lot of things under the surface taking place in everyday activities at home that really help foster a healthy development of, of social skills and relating to other people. So on that note, let's welcome Emily as well, and then we'll get started. Thank you. My name is Emily Ojagian. I am a clinical psychologist at the Lucy Daniels Center. I work in the Family Guidance Service Department. And I see children and families and parents in individual therapy. And like Jen was saying, I hope to bring a clinical lens to the conversation today. And I'm excited for us to jump in. All right, let's get started. So before, before we get started in, in thinking about the everyday activities, we wanted to just talk a little bit about what it is that schools uh, usually provide when there's not a pandemic. Uh, there are a, a number of opportunities for children to practice their social skills in a school setting or in any other group setting. You know, for some children, it may be um, just other extracurricular groups and in addition to the school or uh, even neighborhood play. They're, they're, children typically have a lot of opportunities to practice what they're learning from their parent relationships. So a hot topic this year, of course, has been this question about social development of children when they've been missing so much in-person school experience. And a lot of children who have been back in school in person, it looks a lot different than it did pre-pandemic. There's a lot of social distancing. There's a lot of limitation around how much they can uh, interact with each other. Um, Lunch time and snack times have become silent periods for a lot of kids at school and the, the play on the playground is different. So there's this on everyone's minds, teachers, parents has been, it's been this question of what about the social development? Is my child going to fall behind? So we wanted to just 
go do a little overview of what a school provides, but also remind you that it's not really the school that does the teaching of the social skills. A lot of what a child brings to the, the social table at school actually takes root in the relationships at home and in the way parents and other caretaking adults relate to and with the children. So the school is the place where they can practice all of this. They can put it into practice. So, and it offers different types of relationships. That's like the principal and the student, then teacher student, and then there are peers and acquaintances that are not necessarily friends. And then of course, on the most intimate level, there's the friends and the social group. The school also provides social rules and expectations. There's a time for socializing. There's a time for putting your head down and getting to work among your peers and, and uh, controlling that impulse to socialize and delaying gratification and socializing later. There are opportunities for collaboration, both on a playful level, whether it's group games outside that, that come, up, come up and are developed by the children or group games that are uh, dictated by someone like a PE teacher or uh, group projects that are dictated by a classroom teacher. So, so collaboration with those who are your friends and collaboration maybe with those with whom you're not so comfortable, but you're still asked to collaborate with, with that group. There are shared, often shared responsibilities in a classroom, class chores, class, um, you know, everyone's responsible for keeping their space clean. So there's this sense of, I have my part in this greater group of people. And then of course, the, the, the typical, you, what you need to do in school is you need to be able to wait, you need to be able to take your turn, share when it's appropriate, delay gratification, meaning, you know, I'll put my wishes to the side for a little bit while I do my work, and then I'll play that game when I get outside. So this, this is uh, a lot of what the, the school setting provides, but a child's ability to come into this group and, and function at a level where they're comfortable and they're social actually comes from a lot of the the core pieces and aspects of their relationships with their parents at home. So before we get into the activities, the everyday activities at home, we thought we would just share a couple of quotes from our staff. We decided to ask, ask our staff, what, what role do you think parents play in the social development of children? So, here you can see, um, let me just, I can't quite read it. Parent-child communication can play a significant role in a child's development of social skills. The communication used at home is likely to transfer into the child's social relationships in the future. Providing a supportive and safe space for dialogue and the ability to work through difficulties in a meaningful, intentional, and nurturing way will only help foster successful relationships down the road. That was one of our teachers' thoughts on the role of parents in social skills development. And I'll read the next quote. Our children don't learn these skills because they are being taught, this is what you say and this is how you do it. The vast majority of social skill learning is in the lived experience of how they are treated and how they are encouraged to be curious about their internal worlds and others' internal worlds. And that was from a Lucy Daniel Center clinician. And if I can add a little bit onto that as well, how they are encouraged to be curious. Again, it doesn't have to be that they are directed to be curious or instructed to be curious. It's powerful for a child to see a caring adult be curious themselves to demonstrate what it's like to be confident in oneself and be vulnerable at the same time makes me think of Mr. Rogers and how Mr. Rogers is still such a, an impactful and, and influential figure because he, he embodied this. He was able to comfortably express his curiosity in his own thoughts and feelings and also the curiosity in someone else's experience. That's a really good example, Emily, actually Mr. Rogers, because he was always curious and was curious in a way that was not threatening and was very welcoming of whatever that curiosity would uncover. It didn't really matter. If he was curious about someone being angry, he wasn't put off by that being exposed. And I think mm -hmm. that that's really key is this curiosity 
I think we're going to hold on to that idea, curiosity, and also hold on to, from the first quote, hold on to the, the piece about communication. Because I think these two pieces really play a role in supporting the development of, of a, a child who can really relate to oneself as well as to others in a really healthy way. Communication and curiosity. So we'll let's try to hold on to those themes as we go through these activities and think about maybe where they show up in, in some of these activities under a little bit under the surface. So behind the scenes, this is where we're getting, behind the scene, scenes of social skills. Um, because our goal today is not to give you a list of activities to practice. Our goal is not to give you a script to teach your child how to be social and how to be polite and how to share properly. Our goal is to help you think about these everyday activities a little differently. And so in doing, before we can do that, let's just think about what happens behind the scenes. So in a, in a healthy relationship, there, are, there is the self. So that's, let's just say myself. And uh, what I bring to that is understanding my own feelings and, and reactions and understanding um, my reactions to my to experiences. So that's, that's my insight. That's an important piece of relating is understanding myself. So we start with self and then Emily, you're gonna talk a little bit about other. And in order for that self, <clears throat> excuse me, in order for that self piece to be there, the complement to it is also understanding that there is the other. Understanding that others have their own thoughts, feelings, desires, motivations. This is where we see the development of empathy. And this is where we see differentiation. Differentiation, in other words, is that I know I can feel and think one thing. And someone else is going to feel and think something else. And that it's safe. It's okay for us to have a different perspective on the same thing. That it doesn't have to be threatening. And then in a relationship, the two come together and have to be balanced. And the balance, I, I was thinking a lot about this, but um, as we were leading up to this webinar, the balance is not, again, it's also not scripted. It's not a formula. It's not always the same. The balance uh, moves depending on how either party is feeling at any given moment. So in a, in a healthy relationship, both parties or multiple parties are able to balance their own needs and desires, their, their, what, what they bring with those of others. And in, in a way that is um, not selfish, it's not more of I need my needs to be met, but it's also not overly, um, we, we, don't want, we don't want sacrificed desires, we want a balance of everyone's needs being met in a way that is enough for each party to feel content and happy. And in, in a, a relationship, when this is in the, when there's these two sides, then you can enter into conflict re resolution or negotiation and compromise in, a, and caring for oneself and caring for others in a really healthy way that isn't tipping the scale too far in either direction. Do you have anything to add to that, Emily, or start? Uh, I'll, the only thing I'll add is that negotiation and compromise, that theme is also going to come up again a few more times throughout these slides. So um, actually, Jen, do you mind sharing the example you had you had shared with me before about um, like in the classroom, seeing if a classmate has is having a really tough day, being able to share a toy with them, but it's also not, it's not your favorite most prized toy. I thought that that example is really a, yeah. a great one. Yeah, I was actually thinking about that even more uh, this morning, Emily. I was thinking about um, one year in the classroom, I made, there, there was this issue about fairness and that's not fair. Why does, why does so-and-so get that? And that, that's not fair. And I, I had this lesson on fairness, that fairness doesn't mean that everyone gets the same thing. Fairness means that everyone's treated with the same respect and the same understanding that needs might be different at different moments in time. That's fairness. Not that we all just get the same thing. 
Um, so I think, Emily, the example you're talking about in the classroom is, um, you know, a lot of times kids are encouraged to share and it's the right thing to do. You should share your toys. That's what, that's what polite children do. But take, say, for example, a child had a, a rough start to their day, a young child, let's say, you know, preschool, kindergarten, first grade age. They've had a rough start to their day. They really struggled with saying goodbye to their mom or their dad when they were dropped off. They're, they're just a little bit, just a little bit vulnerable throughout the day. And they, they're holding their, one of their prized toys. That's not the kind of day to, not for, force is a bit strong of a word, but that's not the day to ask that child to share that possession with others. That's a day to say, you know, today's been, it's been rough. And I, I understand if you're not feeling like sharing today. Uh, so th this is what we what we mean when we when we talk about um, flexibility in the social expectations, flexibility in one's ability to just read the situation, read the other, and and then meet them where they are. And that's really what we try to do in our classrooms is is not have a specific definition of this is what's polite, this is what's socially acceptable. It's more of that flexibility to to read the situation and understand that people have varying capacities depending on how they're feeling. Okay, so now I think we can move into some of those everyday activities that Emily and I um, came up with and just invite you to think about ways to encourage this curiosity that, um, that, that quote mentioned and also how to build communication in these areas. So we'll start with um, reading. So the reading, the, the, the reading of words, that's the, the mechanical part. And then the reading and experiencing literature. And this is what we want to fo focus on. We're in, when we talk about reading in the context of social skills development, we're not talking about he or she can, can read a sentence, they can, they can read a page. It's more about reading and really diving in and thinking about what's taking place in a story. So we encourage children, especially uh, children, young children in the preschool and throughout the elementary school to read and reread the same stories because a lot of times a child will go back and they'll notice something that they didn't notice the first or the fifth time that they read it. Um, reading, reading fiction especially provides a, a very a really safe space for children to develop that curiosity about, about uh, characters, about motives, uh, perspective, understanding why someone might have made a certain decision. It, it's, re it's removed from the child and it's in a fictional space. So it's a really safe space to, to think and talk about uh, conflict resolution and, and problems that characters run into. Uh, there's a lot of research that says that reading fiction plays a really important role in the development of empathy. And I, I believe that that starts with empathy for oneself, and then that grows into empathy for others. So with really young children, when I'm reading picture books, oh dear, I'm not sure what happened there. Did you, oh, sorry about that. Uh oh, we've got a little problem, Emily. Internet connectivity issue? Yeah. I'm just going to continue talking. Um, we'll just continue talking. Okay. <laughs> share the slides another time. Um, where was I? That, that threw me off a little bit. Uh, oh, when I'm reading uh, picture books to children, I, I really uh, like to pause and think about uh, why, why a child did something, why, why do you think that happened, why did, why did a character do something, and it really invite the group to be thinking about that together. Um, so, so children who struggle with um, inferences in social situations, they also tend to struggle with anything that's not really concrete in reading comprehension. And so for those children, they, we, we encourage you to, to 
talk about that and model that. So one, one way to do that might be saying something like, it's really hard to know what this character's thinking because it doesn't, it doesn't say it. Um, let's try to figure that out together. Let's, let's think about whether there are some clues about what he or she is thinking. Um, and Emily, you were gonna talk about the older- Yeah, character. I'm trying to see if I can- Yes, great. Are we, we back yeah. on? Okay. Yeah. Super. Okay, cool. Thank you. <laughs> <laughs> so to piggyback off of the point that Jen is bringing up, again, we're, we're thinking of this piece of curiosity. In these conversations you can have with your child about these characters, about what's going on, not only are you helping them to foster that curiosity, but also as a reminder for yourself to look at how is your curiosity functioning. I think it's a, a natural gut instinct of a parent to default to comfort, to reassurance, even to teaching. Um, a common example is a parent and a child are reading a story together and the, the child might remark, oh, you know, the, the hippopotamus is feeling sad. And a parent, it's a natural instinct to jump in and say, oh, no, it's okay. They don't have to be sad. And I guess our suggestion is to pause and just examine your curiosity in that moment. And you might have to work a little bit to keep that space open to then investigate with your child, what are the reasons for feeling sad or to even just sit in that moment of, oh yeah, they're feeling sad. Because if a child has a prolonged and repeated experience of hearing from other adults of, oh no, they don't have to be sad. then it can start to plant that seed of some fear or discomfort like, oh, it's not okay to be sad or, if people are sad, then we shouldn't bring it up. So that curiosity does so much more than just expand thinking. It also creates so much space for any and all feelings to be acknowledged and for it to feel safe. Again, going back to Mr. Rogers, you had this felt experience of you could bring up anything and he would welcome it and he'd be comfortable with it. And that's a really good point. And we just want to add that just, it just made me think of something that our tendency, and it's just because we want we want children to be happy and comfortable, and you don't want to think about your child as sad or upset or angry. So our tendency is to try to fix, try to correct, try to make better, right? We we want to say about the character, we might want to say something like, "Oh, but look, look what's happening now. He's he's going to be okay." We want to quickly go to what's going to fix the sad feelings. And I, as you, before you mentioned Mr. Rogers, I was already thinking of him and thinking about how part of his gift with children was to sit with that feeling. And in, in a way that's actually more comforting to a child to, to feel seen for how they're feeling, seen in that moment, than having it quickly fixed and ma made happy again being seen as a as a being with a range of feelings is much more comforting actually and being able to have someone ride that out and tolerate that with them and and see them through it and i i just think that that's something to think about is even though our instinct is to just we want to just make it better for them we want to make them feel more comfortable mm -hmm. yeah. and if we if we play this out in in the lens of social skills long term, that also means we want to raise kids so that when they are in in friendships with others, they feel comfortable saying, you know, I'm just really, I'm really sad today. Or, you know, I had a, I had a rough morning. This is what happened. And then extrapolating even further that when they're in romantic relationships, that they can also talk in those ways with their partners, that they don't feel like they have to quickly fix and make better whatever whatever pain they're going through, that, that those emotions can be shared comfortably and, and safely and that they're welcomed. So the, the second bullet point is really just, it's emphasizing what Jen has already talked about, that reading is an extension of play, that like safe bubble where 
emotions, thoughts, events can be explored. There can be that feeling of mastery, of seeing someone's growth, someone's struggle, how they resolve conflict, how they reach for help, how they retreat. I mean, I think we can all probably think of at least one book that is tied to our heartstrings, that really had a, an impact on us at some point in our development. And likely the reason is that we were able to either identify with something emotional happening in that story, or we learned something really powerful from it. And there is that play space of we felt safe being able to see and go along with a character who is experiencing something really profound. Yeah, so I think the takeaway from this, from reading activities is making it more of a, a shared experience, pausing and thinking more. Um, it's not just about getting from page one to the last page and now we've read, it's really what type of communication and curiosity can be, can, can take place in that shared experience. And with older readers who are reading independently, that, that can still happen. Sometimes it's beneficial to read a book alongside an older child where you're reading the same book and you can really think about uh, the characters. And it's awesome when you can actually have different opinions about the characters and different perspectives on why they made made their made decisions the way they did. Um, other, you don't have to read the book alongside alongside your child. You can also just invite your child to just share and just so you know what are you, what are you reading and so what's happening and what do you think about that and really just digging into it and thinking thinking together in this curious way. I think a, a great example that comes to my mind is I've heard of a lot of different families reading the Harry Potter series with their kids all together. And that that can be a pretty polarizing book in terms of the differing opinions on what's what's happening, why people did what they did. Is it okay? Should I, they have made a different decision? And I've heard of a lot of really interesting conversations that spring up around um, different family members interpreting a scene in very different ways. And that is such a rich conversation. That in itself is really important for a child to see, oh, you can look at one situation in so many different ways. And that's also another piece of empathy. A child can have this experience of, oh, my gut feeling of why something is happening. That's not necessarily the full explanation. I can stop, think, and investigate. And there might be a lot more that's happening if I just pause for a few moments to really think about it. And plus, I mean, the, the characters in some of these books, they're so complex. You don't have the typical good guy, bad guy anymore. A lot of times you'll see the bad guy who is lashing out from, from pain, from hurt, from fear, from rejection. And all of those themes are so rich to be able to explore with uh, kids and just everyday conversation. So many of the early childhood picture books have good, good guys and bad guys, or you know, the good character and then the, the villain. I, I always like to, you know, kid, kids will often quickly go to, you know, oh, that's the bad guy, that's the, he's bad. Um, I, I like to invite children to think, is he? Let's think about what's happened to him. Let's think about how he's been perceived. You know, how has the, how has that poor wolf been perceived his whole life? And is he bad? Or let's think, let's, you know, let's not just jump to that conclusion. So there, there was a lot of opportunity to do that, even with the really classic picture books from, in, from early childhood. And that reminds me, there, there's that book, what is it, Babwa and William? Yes, exactly. Does that perfectly. It retells yeah. the, the tale of the, the wolf and the sheep, but you get to see it from the wolf's perspective, why he's so like mean and bristly. All right, I'm gonna try and go to the next slide. I think I know how to do it. Okay, there we go. Yeah, games. So playing games together, of course, that's a very social activity for families. And there is a lot you can do in a board game or in a, a card game with children to help them really 
extend and deepen their flexibility in thinking about others. So for young children, games play an important role in helping them develop the ability to take turns and wait a little bit. So rules are very important. So understanding and following the rules become, that's part of the ritual of playing a game. It's understanding, okay, this is how we play. We're going to follow the rules as we play. And for young children, again, too, it, the, it's the beginning of accepting wins and losses. Sometimes you win, sometimes you lose. One of the things we like to say in our Lucy Daniel School classrooms is that we, winning a game, winning a board game doesn't reflect or say anything about who you are as a person. We help the children understand the context of the win and the loss that, that's, that it's in the context of the game and sometimes you win and sometimes you lose, but some children struggle with that. They they connect the loss to some deeper meaning about their their capacities or their abilities or who they are as a person. You know, good guys win. You know, getting back to the good guys and bad guys. Good guys win, bad guys lose. Does this mean I'm bad? So we really try to um, separate that out and help children uh, understand that the, the context of the win and or the loss. It's important to. Uh, stick to the rules and if, if you've decided to do so from the beginning. Uh, I like to set the rules at the beginning of each game, even if it's a game we play every day in the classroom. It's, it's a good reminder of this is what the rules are and this is how we're going to play the game. You just set the stage before you even begin. And um, I, I think that it's, it's even helpful to write the rules down so it's very clear, this is how we're going to play the game. This is what the rules are today. And maybe even decide as a group, what are we gonna do if someone doesn't follow the rules? What's, are we going to, are we going to pause and, and negotiate? Are we going to end the game? Just going into the game with that sense of, uh, this is what's going to happen if someone doesn't follow the rules. So those are some of the things that we do in the classrooms with young children and board and card games. And for older children, it, the same mentality applies. They're just practicing it on continually more and more sophisticated and mature levels. Um, we see this happening both in board games and also video games. Prior to COVID, video games, board games, it was already a method through which kids could feel connected to each other. I think we're seeing that exponentially more now that a lot of kids are using video games as ways of staying connected with their peers. Um, but that's also an opportunity for parents to be able to connect with your kids if you aren't already engaging with them um, or if you feel like, ah, you know, I don't really like video games or I don't know really how to play them or what I'm doing. I There's a good chance a lot of your kids would love the opportunity to teach you how to play a video game. Uh, imagine what it would be like for them to be like, oh man, I can teach my mom this, I can teach my dad how to do this. So there can be a lot of opportunities for connection and, and pride as well. And these moments of connection, I think for pre-adolescents, adolescents, you don't even have to do a lot of talking. Kids can feel that comfort and moment of connection, just being able to sit down next to their parent and play and play Minecraft. That in itself feels like such a bonding moment there where you don't have to sit there and talk about, you know, the story arc of these characters, um, but there's still richness in there. There's still richness in exploring with your child. Oh, what is it about this avatar? Like, or to understand how did they arm themselves, for example. It's all ways of continuing to be able to grow that curiosity about oneself and to clarify you know, what does feel good and what, what doesn't feel good. You know, Emily, speaking of yeah. curiosity, I was just thinking about one of, the, one of the other things we do in the Lucy Daniel School classrooms is uh, help a child before they enter a game or enter into something that's somewhat competitive, help them stop and notice how they're feeling and whether they're in a state of mind to accept a win or, or accept a win gracefully or accept a loss with, you know, also with grace. So I think this is an opportunity uh, to come back to that curiosity piece to, and the communication piece to help a child notice how they're feeling. You know, if, 
if a child has had a, a rough day and you just, you know, little things are just tipping them over the edge, it's probably not the night to play sorry. You know, it's probably not a good idea to put a, a child in that position where they're under all that pressure to, to be competitive and, and, you know, have to accept getting sent back to the beginning. And it's so, and I think that rather than just saying, no, we're not playing, it's a great opportunity to say, you know, I think today was just one of those days where the little things felt so much bigger. And I just, I don't know that it's going to feel good to play that game right now. That could, that invites the child to think about how their state of mind affects how they can enter into uh, game situations. So that that's, that's one example of, of digging in a little deeper and thinking about how emotions affect one's ability to come to the table. Mm -hmm. And I'd, I'd add on to that, that you can always follow it up with, hey, let's just make some hot chocolate and watch a movie. Right, and that's the flexibility, right? That's part of the, you modify what you're doing based on how you're feeling, and it's the understanding of the other. And the, that's the parent modeling that, that I understand that things have felt harder today, and I'm, I'm doing something to provide comfort. Exactly. Yeah. It's not, you don't, uh, you don't do that. You don't do the cup of hot chocolate every day. Right. Right. There are other days when you're like, get a grip, pull it together. Come on, you gotta get to school or, you know, not <laughs> let's sit down and have that cup of hot chocolate. So that's the flexibility is that it changes based on what's taking place. Mm -hmm. Yeah. We, we as grownups and especially now during COVID we've heard this term self-care so much more and that's just a good example of a, of a self-care moment where your insight and your, your putting words to this is also helping your child get a better sense of knowing when they can kind of call it for themselves. Like, okay, yeah, I, I just need to take it easy tonight. And that's okay, because it's not going to be every night. But tonight is one of those nights that I just... Yeah, okay, I'll take it a little easy. Right, you can't take it easy every night. <laughs> right. <laughs> Sometimes you have to, exactly. Right. Yeah. Uh, and this last bullet point, again, it's just echoing something that Jen has already shared. This, how a, a younger child then moves to this older, more mature, more sophisticated way of managing wins and losses with grace and respect we all know someone or work with someone who is a sore loser or a sore winner. And both of those can be equally unappealing. And I would say, <laughs> I would bet money that for those people that you know, they probably did not have enough support to figure out how to manage these things when they were kids. And it stuck with them throughout their lives which ties into this point of so much of what is learned around games is connected to being an adult who can function independently. I mean, what is a job interview other than a really complex game of steps and moves and patience and turning over cards and not knowing what it's going to say on the other side? And yes, you're able to move forward or no, sorry, you have to take two steps back. All of these things can be rooted in these moments that your kids can have with you about how to work your way through a game. And we have a question from the audience. Um, at what ages can children start to understand their own emotions and use that understanding to make choices about behavior and activities? It's a really great question. So the, uh, my answer to that would be, um, that there is no age for every child that they start to do this. And I think it's a very gradual process. If you think um, about how a child learns how to walk, let's just take that classic example. For most children, it's not one day crawling, next day standing, walking perfectly. I think that social and emotional development is very similar, that it's rarely a sudden, now I can do it. It's a very gradual process of initially having the parent do four in the beginning. Do The parent does everything. I mean, and 
when a baby is first born, the, it's the parent or the caretaker or the, uh, the adult who transports the, the baby from one place to another. There's no ability to move from one place to another. And then over time, the, uh, an infant and toddler becomes more able to, to move him or herself. So I, I think that the answer to this question is that it starts with young children with parents stepping in and naming the emotions and feeling with the child to gradually be a child gradually being able to notice these things in themselves. Um, when can a child really do it independently? I, I would say um, that their ability comes and goes. You're going to have seven and eight year olds who can do it sometimes and then who are having a really rough time, a really rough day, and they can't do it at all. And that's totally normal for these abilities to come and go. Um, I, I've, I like to say that development is like the tide coming in. It rolls in a bit, it rolls back out, it rolls in a little bit more, it rolls back out. And so just knowing that those fluctuations are normal and it's all part of uh, the emotional states affecting capacities. But um, yeah, I think that just a parent's role in that is to meet them where they are at any point in that that ability as it comes and goes. And eventually, over time, one becomes completely independent. Hopefully by the time they're about maybe 25. <laughs> That's great. I'm joking. Thanks for taking that one. <laughs> All right, so okay. uh, continuing on, we're, we're looking at, we're still looking at what are the ways in which we can see and support the, the social skills development at home, looking at household chores and responsibilities. This list is pretty self-explanatory. So when children are given chores and responsibilities at home, it's encouraging accountability um, it's helping them understand and practice completing tasks that are not preferred. It's building self-care skills, and it's also building pride. There are children who will drag their feet, who will not be in the mood to do a chore, but oftentimes once they complete it, you will see that pride. And not only is it pride in having done something, but it's also pride in having managed their emotions successfully and having been able to tolerate you know, I'm not a big fan of it, uh, I'd rather not do it, but I pushed myself or I found the motivation and I was able to still do it. I mean, we all, we're all in the midst of this right now. There are so many things that we don't want to be doing, but we really have to push ourselves to do it because we know it's good for ourselves. We know it's taking care of ourselves and there's still pride in that at the end of the day, even though we can all feel exhausted by it. So the last two points, observing the collective effort is um, one that takes place in classrooms. You know, everyone has their part, everyone has a piece of responsibility. It, it takes place in families too, that there's a collective effort to keep things running smoothly. And I think, again, you know, thinking about flexibility and uh, just noticing that some days might be different from others, there's, uh, there's a place for stepping in and, and doing someone's chore for them on a day when they're having a harder day, but not just doing it silently because you don't wanna rock the boat, doing it with awareness and with um, intent. And, and one could say, for example, again, getting back to the example of you're just having a rough day, you're having, you've been having a really hard time, there's been all these little things, I'm going to, uh, I'm gonna clear the table tonight, even though that's usually your chore. It's, I, I got it. Why don't you just take it easy? I think that's a great way to model, again, this, this type of flexibility. And that helps, um, it, it helps develop some empathy. It's, it's modeling of empathy and mo modeling of understanding that people feel uh, capable at moments and not capable at other moments. And lastly, household chores and responsibilities help to develop an awareness of one's role in a greater system, whether it's the family system or their class or their community or your workplace, everyone plays a part. And just knowing that what one person contributes is part of 
the, the whole system operating smoothly. Yeah, it's something that Jen and I had talked about previously is, you know, we want to see kids who are able to walk into a school and see the school janitor and have respect for him or her, knowing that there's, they're an integral role in this entire system working and in everybody being able to take care of the system of each other. So we're at our, our final takeaways of this webinar. Yeah, so I, I think it's self-explanatory. I think, I hope that the, the, one of the takeaways is that every everyday activities in childhood build that foundation for a well-rounded social being. And they can play, they're, they're going to play a role even if you're not doing all these extra things that we talked about, because these things are just learned over time. But they can play a, a, a bigger role, I think, or a more meaningful role if, if, you, if you can expand on them in the way we've described, begin to see what, what's taking place in a certain interaction or what's taking place in um, different social scenarios and really invite that curiosity and flexibility um, in, in, into your child's mind. Um, I think if you can do that, it's a real gift for a child. So just like, like Emily mentioned, Mr. Rogers a couple of times, doing, inviting that curiosity in a way that's just welcoming and safe and comforting. Um, it's not just how, about how you play, it's how you operate within a community. So it's, it's not just about the script of playing fairly or following the rules, it's how you are flexible and how you're able to read others and have respect for others' emotional states as they, as they change. And aim for insight and compassion over competition and status. Uh, looking back at this, I, I might slightly reword this, but the main point I was trying to go for is that I think our, our society can tend to value competition and status over insight and compassion. And that it's, it is very feasible to have healthy competition, a healthy desire for achievement and success. And can we also work at helping instill in in our children, that you can value compassion and insight on the same level. That if you have all those things working together, that it's going to look very differently than if the top priority is that competition and achievement of status. Um, and echoing what we had talked about in some other slides, that interplay, that balance between self and other is important. And it's shifting, it depends on the day, it depends on how the, the individuals are feeling. But again, maintaining that curiosity of being able to check in with yourself and check in with another person. Negotiation and compromise is such an important skill. And I know that what we've talked about through all of this, it can seem like it's, it's just small details. We're not talking about doing anything major. And I think what, Jen and I are trying to do is, is highlight what are the things that are hidden in plain sight? What are those small moments, those conversations that feel like, you know, they happen just in passing or they're not really having a big impact, that there might be actually more meaning to it than what you first realized. That there are a lot of meaningful conversations and interactions that are happening and could happen that are just waiting there to be discovered. Then we have our information slide. If you're interested in more support, you can contact us here at our website. Yeah, thank you for, for joining us. It was fun to have this discussion with you, Emily. Thanks for doing this with me. Um, one last comment I want to make is that um, it, for some children, children, it's not enough to, to just have these, to be using everyday activities and to 
foster and support the social skills development. Some children do need more. They need more time. Um, that's also part of just understanding that it's going to be a different process for each child. There is, I don't like to put set ages on when children achieve these social milestones, but um, you know, some children do need more support in this area. And if if you do, if you feel that your child is one of those children who needs more, there are people who can help you think about the ways to to provide that amount of support, that right support to help them grow and and flourish socially. But thank you, everyone, for joining us. Yes, thank you. This was great.